Good day and welcome to another special edition of the Offside Museums podcast. My name is Oke Ndibe. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of my co-host Emeko Nyagwa. In today's special episode, we are going to be looking at political developments around Nigeria, particularly a series of meetings that happened last week in London, featuring at least three governors or more, and three of the presidential, three presidential candidates representing perhaps the three major political parties uh, lining up for next year's election. There was also the former president, Olusegun Obasanjo, who was involved in the meetings. In today's podcast, we're going to look at the meaning uh, of all those uh, meetings in London, the significance of the choice of London as venue, and what impact, if any, are those meetings and other developments this week going to have in Nigeria's next upcoming elections in February of 2023. You're welcome. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, first things first, man, you've you started um, teaching uh, just until... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you started, you started feeling some students. So. I've, I've started <laughs> teaching. I'm really excited. Um, my students are excited to explore African literature with me, to explore fiction. And um, uh, so that explains the fact that we are not uh, sitting next to each other. So we're uh, speaking not from, physically at least yeah not physically <laughs> yes <laughs> and also there were uh developments i should say i extend my sympathies to you i know you're a big boxing fan <laughs> and you were really terribly devastated by the loss of anthony joshua uh believed last weekend um and also um <laughs> the nigerian um ufc ufc fighter i think it's it tomorrow yes you know who lost in a devastating uh knockout um so i know that that has troubled you quite a bit but uh, um we're here to you know bake um a different kind of uh nama <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'm still getting, one day i'll get over it man i don't know yeah. one day one day I'll get over it. I don't know when, know. but one day I will. Yeah. One day yeah. I will. So, um, yeah. it, it's, so, it's still, I'm still having nightmares. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> I've, I've talked nightmares. to you a couple of times about it and I, I know that the wound is still, is still one there. Day, but, one day I'll get over it. You know? I still believe, I believe in them. They will, they yes. will, um, come back and they will make me happy one day. Yes. Uh, either for Usman, either that or you go out and you make yourself happy. <laughs> <laughs> Those guys make me happy, man. They make me I happy. I know, I know. They but that's actually happy. the risk we run when we depend on on other people, especially professional athletes or or soccer teams and so on, to to bring us joy. That okay, occasionally they bring that joy, but just as as often they bring us disappointment and and leave us emotionally devastated. So yeah, it's um, painful though. Yeah. Okay, so let's pivot uh, yes. back to yep. uh, speaking, of, speaking of those people are people who take risks. Yes. To bring but us joy. Precisely. Who take people risks? Who take risks to bring, to bring see, us joy. Bring us sadness. Yes. <laughs> so, so here are our politicians. Um, excuse me. Particularly, um, here is um, Governor Wike, who was. Uh, a presidential candidate in the People's Democratic Party. He came second in their primaries um, behind Atiku, the ultimate winner. Um, and he's been signaling since then 
you know, sort of that he's not just going to stand behind Atiku as a party's presidential candidate, that he wants some issues addressed. Uh, there were speculations that he wanted to be vice president, a vice presidential candidate on the ticket. Uh, but in the run up to the, to the primaries, he had, um, been very dismiss, dismissive of that idea. He proposed that he really wanted the top of the ticket, not to be the, um, sort of the sidekick. Um, but then, you know, so there have been all these back and forth, you know, some days Atiku would announce that, you know, Wike is on board, Wike will make the noise that, you know, he's not going to any other party. Uh, but he's been holding meetings, he's been holding consultations. And then he goes to London. And at the same time that he's in London, um, these are the candidates, presidential candidates, uh, show up. Um, and Wike comes back with uh, Governor Ibazo of um, Abia State uh, with um, uh, Sam Autumn, Governor of uh, Benue State. And they hold, they held a press conference when Wike is talking about the, uh, the substance of the meeting, series of meetings that are held in London was to discuss, was um, a discussion around how to create a better Nigeria. Okay. And I don't know about you, but it, it robbed me the wrong way. And before I start spelling out all the ways in which it robbed me, uh, perhaps you want to come in. I don't know if you feel as strongly about all of this as as I feel. You know, I mean, for me, I I feel like it's, it's um, par for the course. Um, standard procedure. Um, we can act like it's not been what's been happening since the 1940s when Nigeria was on the march to independence, and ever since afterwards. But it's the case. Um, every major milestone. Every major junction, every major, um, um, whatever you might call it that Nigeria has had, has mm-hmm. had, you would see the British continuously, somehow, some way, you know, in the shadows. And I, and I, and I, I don't say that like, because people would say, well, oh, they're just some people, some people might say, oh, they were just in England, you know, oh man, it's just England. They're just in, they were just, but you know, how many, is it is it a coincidence that every time, whether it's Obasanjo, whether it's um, this thing, whether it's our independence leaders from Zeke to even our Walla Wall, all spending time there, um, and long since after, is it a coincidence that after the first coup and the the, the, the AFAC, the first coup in particular, you go back and you every account, every this, every um, um, every first hand account. Every unclassified document, MI6, um, CIA, they speak about it, the role of the Americans and it, well, the British backed by their back, backed by America, um, that they play. So it, it feels like, oh, there's a, if you look at it, if, the, if you're taking a step back and you're looking at, you are looking at it, you're just like, well, these people have some colonial fantasies. That's why they're going to, to, to London, but mm-hmm. I mean, if it's every time from the forties till today that crit- any critical juncture, whether it's in or outside Nigeria, the British are always around. Um, you know, there are coincidences and they're just routine things that tend to happen. And judging by, you know, it's not like, it's not like, let's assume, let's play the game that the British always have their hands there, right? Mm-hmm. It's not like they have a hard hand to play. They can't, or oh, if you don't do what I'm going to do, I'm going to, you know, harm you or destroy you. What they have is a soft hand. Well, it, not soft, not, no, not a soft hand. They have a hard hand, but they play with soft power. 
Okay. You know, in this, but you know, this is the way it mo it certainly is. They play with soft. You know, you gotta do this, you gotta do that, you gotta do this, you gotta do that. You have a whole bunch of these actors right now. Um, all Wiki is Wiki is key mm -hmm. because without Wiki, PDP have no chance, none, zero. Um, the three major, the three major parties, even though you have some political actors that discount the PTLB movement, which is, you know, their right to go about saying what they want to say. Um, but I think it's disingenuous at the very least to discount, to discount PTLB's mm -hmm. uh, popularity at this point in time. Um, so you, you, the three major parties, you, without rivers, PDP is dead in the water. Mm -hmm. Um, they would have problems. Um, could they surmount them? It's possible. Um, Bola Tinubu and Co should even start a conversation without, because I don't, would they pick up, they'll pick up some places in the North, maybe Katsina, a few places, um, but they are going to lose a lot of places. Um, so the key part about having Wiki there is Wiki and the British and all this and whatever is going on is Wiki is the one that's carried the party. Wiki River State is one of the most indebted states in the country. It's also an oil producing state. So they make a lot of money and they spend a whole lot of money as well. Um, they've kept the PDP afloat. They've um, installed uh, financially. They've been the financial power that have installed a lot of political actors, not just in this, not just in the river states, but in other places like Benway, the Southeast. So they hold a fair amount of sway. There's no doubt about it. If, you know, Wiki didn't get what he wanted. Now the question is, what does Wiki want? Mm -hmm. Because wherever he chooses to lay his head is going to most likely be the people that end up winning. Um, judging by the system. Now, you know, we can always caveat with the PW movement, for instance, might be stronger than the weekend. It's possible. Um, but judging by some of the comments this week, redeploying the people that implemented the um, electronic voting and, and all those things, the um, not this week or last week, judging by that redeployment of the guy from Abuja and all that and some statements by the INEC that they're going to be collecting some of the votes by hand. Um, we've seen this, we know the story, man. So uh, that's the way I see it pretty yeah. much. Yeah. So. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I think that um, it's interesting uh, on some level, uh, because as I told you before we started the podcast, there is, um, there's a sense of visceral outrage in me, you know, about this whole... British angle to the Nigerian conversation um, that it both it both suggests um, a kind of uh, colonized inferior mentality on the part of our political leaders to run to Daddy Britain to hold this what are unquote important conversations about how to. Um, put Nigeria in a better place. But also it suggests, as you said, this shadow of Britain, uh, of course, as the puppet master sort of in the background. It suggests it. I'm not sure how uh, powerful that suggestion correlates with reality, but it's, it, 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 there's that suggestion that Britain is sort of um, choreographing uh, some of these conversations and choreographing some of the uh, developments that are going to play out ultimately uh, going forward. But before I get sort of deeper into all of that, I think it's, there's something fascinating about we, the game that Wike is playing, you know, and it's, um, as Nigeria goes, it's actually, one of the more interesting politicians in this space, you know, um, he's one of these politicians who was able to take over from uh, the uh, the, uh, the former governor, immediate former governor uh, um, Amechi, and 
transformed the state in, into his own and made Amechi, um, whittled Amechi's influence to, you know, the bare minimum so that he's occupied the state, river state. And he's somebody who has used the wealth of the state to affect the, the politics of other states and other regions within Nigeria, you know. Um, he's also been a kind of in rhetorical games. You know, there is this um, moment where I think it was, um, there was an event and then, um, excuse me, the former governor of Hawaii bomb, Ababio was telling him, oh, you know, leave the PDP and come over to the APC and so on. And he made a very interesting rhetorical response where he says, um, why would I want to leave a headache and take, take up cancer? You know, so he said that the APC uh, that was inviting him to join was was um, a case of cancer, and that the PDP where he was was at worst a headache, right? So it was a very interesting rhetorical um, game, and it seems to me that he's maximized uh, this game of which Zeke famously described as playing the beautiful bride. You know, so Zeke. Um, talked about uh, placing himself and the MPP as a party that needed to be courted into a coalition by any other party that wanted to win um, uh, in 1983. And so in which case, sort of made himself into the beautiful bride. Uh, he's kept his door open to to all the other political parties, you know, come and woo me, you know, that tell me what you got, you know. Uh, but it's, it's a case where the parties are sort of um, talking to Winke because they also know, uh, you know, that he has a lot of money uh, to bring in, um, that he has some considerable political machinery in his home state. Um, that for, there's a sense, you know, people like, again, this is gift of the gab, you know, his ability to mix it up, you know, um, politically and so on. So having said that, so all of that is interesting to me, you know, so it's interesting to find somebody who is playing the political game with some skill. And clearly Wike is perhaps the most skillful political um, player in, 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 in Nigeria who is in the political uh, presidential candidate. Having said that, the idea of congregating in London to discuss political permutations in Nigeria, uh, to discuss a project of making Nigeria a better place and so on, just seems to me uh, so deeply embarrassing, you know, um, on so many levels. First of all, these are the, uh, the so-called um, delegates to this whatever conference, political, informal political conventions that were held in London. You know, Obasan Jowike, Samatam, um, uh, Ipazo, uh, and so on. So these are um, clearly the authors of the political crisis that we have in Nigeria today. I mean, they played um, they're bit players, you know. I mean, there are worse actors than, than, than these, but clearly they are implicated in the crisis within Nigeria. Um, and I'm not sure that they are the ones who, I mean, particularly when somebody like Obasanjo 
um, because Obasanjo's political crimes should be unforgivable if Nigerians had a sense of, have a strong memory, right? Obasanjo acted like an imperial president. Obasanjo could have um, been a different kind of president and deepened the roots of democracy. But what he did was to empower the most reprobate kind of characters, you know, as candidates, as so-called political godfathers. He was contemptuous of uh, the judiciary. He meddled with the legislature. Uh, so he weakened. He over-exercised his power, and he weakened the two other critical um, um, sectors of, of, of power, the judiciary and the legislature during his term. And, and the fact that the man attempted to subvert the constitution in order to give himself a third term, the fact that he ignored judicial verdicts if, he di if, if they didn't go his way, the fact that he lent the police force uh, to some so-called godfathers in Anambra State and Oyo State to terrorize serving governors. So the man to come out today and be part of this ostensible conversation to bring a better Nigeria just totally robs me the wrong way. And seems to me that once he's in the picture, it's as if he nullifies the very idea or the prospect that this is actually a conversation for a better Nigeria. I don't know how you take it, but you know, I like to Yeah, I mean, at this point. I was going to ask you a question how you saw Boston Job, but you've already like, you know, a Boston Job being there because we know we don't, people don't talk about it as much, but you, you know, you, you've already started down that road. And I mean, it's, it's standard. It's par for the course. You, you know, the man of Boston Job, he's, um, I mean, in 70, what, 70, 76, when he came on there, um, even after, during the Civil War, the roles he played, um, even by his own accounts, uh, I'm not even talking about his, his, more, his, I, I mean, if you go into his personal life, it's just an absolute, um, a mess is not, it feels to even describe it. Yeah. Um, a man that has, um, I mean, daughter writing, disowning him. Uh, his son his accused son. him of sleeping I mean, with, his with his wife. You, know, you can't, you can't knows, get sleazier than that. <laughs> this man knows no, no morality whatsoever. Um, and you look at him, when I was in 79, yes, he handed over power. Um, in, well, that's he did his everything. one claim to universal fame. You know, yeah, first... One of the few has military heads of states who returned power to an elected. Well, he, he did everything wrong leader. leading up to that anyway. Um, mm -hmm. to my opinion, he did everything wrong. Um, that was the big ones in office or the little ones, um, like kill I mean, the, the story of how he goes to London, by the way, the same UK where, um, he did a lot of military training on the dime of the government. Mm -hmm. um, he goes there and he sees Nigerian students living okay, living well, and he's not happy. Mm -hmm. He gets back and decides that as a waste um, and starts damaging the educational sector even more than it was, um, which is the famous Ali must go mm -hmm. chants, which people don't remember. Um, mm -hmm. That's um, what they call him. He was PDP chairman. Other boss and Joe was um, in office. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. um, um, uh, well, okay. um, uh, yeah, the the guy who became oh my gosh, what's his name? Um, I was about to say no, I'll do. I'll do. No, I'll do. No, um, I, uh, no, no, I'll do. Uh, he was Colonel Ali. Okay, Ali okay, okay. Yeah. Oh, the Colonel. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, Amadou Ali. Amanda Lee, the Ali must go thing. Ali must go. You know, they, they go in there. It's just, this is just a little. I thought you were talking business. about I'll do a boy for, for a bit. No, no, I'll do a boy mm -hmm. was, was supposedly a farmer, supposedly. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <Supposedly>. <laughs> yes. But, you know, it's, um, 
you see the guy comes back in, he's supposed to be penniless, um, supposed to be all that, you know, and he comes back in 1990, puts him in there. They say he's Amnesty International, mm -hmm. top, all of their top officials. He, he believes in, and he goes in there and he, he acquires every single thing mm -hmm. he can lay his hands on. The only person that did more acquiring than him was Atiku, who, you know, just mm -hmm. literally put the whole economy in his pocket and mm -hmm. <laughs> stepped away from this thing. So you have this guy who, whether maybe he's, He's, he's at an age where he's seen his own mortality and he wants to do something good to maybe right the wrongs that he has consistently done or he wants to put himself in the history books. After all, it's the same guy that said he's the father of modern Nigeria. So, yeah. And you have this guy in the mix there. And, you know, I, I get it. I think he's being in the mix is personal because he definitely does not like uh, Tinubu. Neither does he like Atiku. Atiku. So he like he doesn't like either of these people. Um, it's it's personal to him as well. Um, it's not personal that he wants things to work out. Mm -hmm. he, he doesn't want he doesn't want these guys to win at any cost. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, more importantly, Abbas Nijia is somebody who has. If you go back to his presidency, you go back to uh, the years he was in office. He's somebody who would you, know, you would see him openly always go to the UK, openly. Mm -hmm. Like every Nigerian head of state, where, did, where anybody nowadays is like almost a norm, anybody running for office in Nigeria, you want to take a picture in front of 10 Downing Street. Why? Ask this question. Why don't you want to take a picture in front of the uh, Sheikh of Dubai, where most mm -hmm. of you actually tend to live anyway? Why don't you want to take a picture in front of um, the Swedish prime minister mm -hmm. or the German prime minister or, um, you know, people... U.S. Pre the White House. Mm -hmm. Why is it always they want to take a picture with either the Prime Minister of the UK or a top government official? Typically, it's the Prime Minister when they are running for office. Why mm -hmm. is that always the case? Why you know this, these are not, it doesn't matter whether it's a Buhari that can't produce his school sat or is a Peter B who is now the Wonder Kid. <laughs> you know they all they all go and supplicate themselves in front of that. I don't have any other way to be. If you don't, they go and prostrate themselves. If, if you are, if you know, if you are Yoruba, you know, or from where well, they go to supplicate themselves, supplication as, and, and yeah, you know, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm your guy, man. You know, by like, it's, it's ridiculous, man. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely, um, which other country do you see? That is that is what is sought doing that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You don't see any country that's what they are sought mm -hmm. going to supplicate themselves in front mm -hmm. of foreign mm -hmm. leaders. Mm -hmm. You know, but the ones that are not, you would see them whether the Frank Franco Pong, Franco Franco Pong countries in Africa, you see them going to France uh, supplicate in front of the, you know, um, because the the sort the power France holds over them is the same is similar or maybe more a little bit more open. And the power mm -hmm. that the British, to mm -hmm. me, hold over the Nigeria, because mm -hmm. um, there's really no reason, none, um, zero point minus. In fact, if for anything, really, is Britain should be the ones coming to supplicate themselves mm -hmm. <laughs> because they have they have they are in a serious um, a crisis but, right now. By, in, in by the way, by the way, as you speak, your face part of it's your face. Is, oh, yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, so yeah, you, they, are, you, they, are in a, they are in a serious crisis right now in Europe. You have the war mm -hmm. in Ukraine, mm -hmm. the energy crisis, more or less austerity is, is, is happening. Yeah. And then you should be looking at them and telling them, hey, you guys, you need to come and supplicate yourselves. Yes. I mean, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the French president, <laughs> the French president, Macron, just uh, told the French people, like I think a couple of days ago, that the era of affluence may be coming to an end and they have just come up with projections of energy costs and it's many foods you know um higher than the five-year average over the last like, like, like than the average of the last five years so europe is coming to a huge crisis um that crisis is also going to ultimately affect um 
the rest of the world is going to affect Africa. Um, yeah, and part of it is, of course, that there's this war going on in Ukraine. Nobody is talking about peaceful settlement. It's like NATO is just sending weapons. Uh, Putin is calling in more uh, enlistment in the military. So it's like uh, an annihilation, you know, um, going on. And some people, of course, people have moved on. Most people no longer follow developments in Ukraine from day to day. But it's, the consequences of that war um, are going to affect every part of the world, you know. And um, already in Europe, they are seeing rising energy costs. They are seeing the prospect of blackouts and rationing of, of, of electricity and so on. Um, you know, in, in Spain, you can, you cannot, uh, set your air conditioning, uh, below a certain, um, a certain level that the government tells you, um, you know, so there are all kinds of, all kinds of, um, really terrible things happening. And that's, that's, that's part of why we need the most imaginative and intelligent kind of leader in Nigeria at this point. Somebody who does not have this, who is not beholden to the idea of, of the British as their master. Um, uh, and somebody who can navigate this very perilous, um, order that the world is coming into, or this order, you know, um, where there'll be food crisis, energy crisis, uh, the, the considerable disruptions of the financial market, um, and so on. All of these are coming at a time when um, Nigeria can find its way. I mean, um, there was sort of uh, a, a little bit of, of good news on the economic front where the Nigerian government announced that there was um, a positive growth of the economy and that income uh, increased uh, in July. Now, in a country that is um, data challenge, you don't know if somebody just sat in an office and made up those Maybe figures. They were, they, were counting, they were counting Anthony Joshua and Kamoro's income. <laughs> you never know and so they should you know i hope that i hope that both men are sending some of their earnings uh to relatives in nigeria it should be part of the country's gdp why not <laughs> you know, so, so, yeah um but you know um they uh, and, and and so there's a point that you also touched on you know quite apart from this for me they are gravitating um uh junket in london mm -hmm. uh so there are these are the developments right um <laughs> in nigeria uh one is of course the i next thing about you know they're now they, 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 that they're going to do manual counting of votes that did not work out so well in the past okay uh, and not that the electronic uh, system uh, was not subject subject to grave abuse. But when you go to manual, it becomes easy for a human being to add uh, numbers and digits and so on uh, to the totals of, of, of candidates who have paid the piper and so on, or paid the, the umpire, uh, rather. Um, so it's, it's something that we need to scrutinize and see the rationale for INEC going there, the rationale for moving uh, senior police officers around the country. And, you know, and, and then there's the other um, sort of... Uh, typical uh distraction in our politics you know the whole idea of 
um, of Kashim uh, Shatima, uh, the uh, Tinubu's vice presidential candidate, wearing sneakers to address the, the, the Nigerian lawyers, you know, and so people were all um, outraged and um, sort of spewing invectives and so on. And, you know, so, yeah, I, I figure that if you are a, 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 on a ticket, a presidential ticket, um, that there's a certain level of appearance that people expect you to conform to. But Nigeria's crisis is so profound and multi-sectoral uh, and expressed on so many different domains that the whole idea of focusing on whether somebody wore bathroom slippers, you know, for me at this point is 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 so besides the point. It's yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's a lot. Of, it's a lot. Of, um, I mean, you've touched on now. Uh, you've touched on the uh, INX situation and the the um, data collection. Uh, but you know, the most interesting thing is, is the the memes of of the whole situation and the way Shatima Shatima. Okay, so they had they had the they had the NBA conference in the mm-hmm. US, right? Bola Tinubu is supposedly a resident of Lagos mm-hmm. 24-7, supposedly, mm-hmm. in quotes. Mm-hmm. Um, he lives on board alone. And if I'm not wrong, the event holds, I believe is on Adiola or Deku. So I, I'm not too sure where it was. So let me not quote where it was, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, so it holds, in, it, it holds there, right? It holds mm-hmm. probably... Um, even in bad traffic, it's maybe a 20 minute drive from his house, mm-hmm. 30 minute drive in bad mm-hmm. traffic. Let's assume traffic is bad. Let's even give 40 minutes drive. Um, but you know, the man doesn't try, you know, mm. the man moves, uh, in a like convoy his, of, <laughs> of security people, <laughs> like is it so like a trip that will take uh, models, ordinary models, um, an hour will take him 15. Yeah. He, he, he moves like he's the president. He's been doing that for a long time. So. He can, the point is he can get there, you know, um, but he doesn't go. Mm-hmm. He flies in um, Shetima, who is mm-hmm. a sitting governor, right, uh, from Bronu State, mm. which is... No, he's no state. longer governor. Oh, sorry, okay, Shetima is no longer governor, sorry. Mm-hmm. Um, he flies in Shetima, who supposedly lives at least in Bronu, but let's assume he lives in Abuja, whichever one. So he flies him in for a trip that... Uh, and I was then for Mikeja, you drive to VI, you got a whole distance, but a trip you could go for. Take that aside. Chetima is the mm-hmm. VP, the uh, vice presidential nominee. Mm-hmm. He's the presidential candidate of his mm-hmm. party, right? Mm-hmm. So um, he doesn't go. He sends Chetima. Chetima comes there. Um, is, I, I don't think the, the memes about the whole thing is not just. That the guy comes and and he wears his he wears a pair of sneakers. Hmm. Far from it, the whole get up first things first was just he looked like he brought his suit from somebody and brought yes. his sneakers from somebody. <laughs> <laughs> and then the guy's attitude was just like, <laughs> like you know, it's, it, it's like mm. you're looking at this guy. It's like, do you understand the mess this country is in? Like you're sitting down, you simply don't seem to care whatsoever. You know, you just, you just, it's almost like I sent my son and he brought my suit and he just sat down there. Yeah, like, God, no, where are my toys? I want to play with that, 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 that's, that's actually the point because, you know, again, I'm not, you know, you and I know I'm not um, big on, on dressing. I, mm-hmm. I prefer sim- the most simple. So simplicity is my key. Mm-hmm. Um, but if I were to do a critique of the guy, what actually struck me was how loose fitting his, <laughs> his suit and his, tra- you know, trousers, a pair of, you know, pair of trousers, his pants, as Americans would say, looked, it, 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 you know, it just was indeed as if somebody said to him, no, don't wear 
your kaftan or something, you need to wear a suit. And he said, I don't have one. And they said, you know, somebody much bigger said, okay, here, take my own, go to the, you know, who knows whether, you know, uh, the pant was so big and loose that maybe he used a rope to tie it or something because, you know, so, uh, you know. so again, again, comic relief, but the the issues in our country are really, and I don't think, I mean, his speech was not uh, a bad speech. His presentation wasn't bad, right? Mm -hmm. it, it was that people focus on this, his get up, right? So much. And of course, he should be mindful of that. And, you know, there's this message that he, um, his campaign released that, oh, you know, he's... Um, Jim Ovia's boy, you know, he was trained in the banking, so he knows his stuff. And um, that he came there deliberately to to rattle those who were already looking to, to be critical of him and so on. And he repeated a version of what he said before once um, that uh, sort of that he and Tinubu were the dream team you know, so here he says Tinubu will be running the economy as if Tinubu was um, uh, a wizard of economic management. And then that he will be handling security and um, was quite boastful of the way that uh, he handled uh, the security crisis in, in his state and in the Northeast when he was governor. Well, um, it's it's a tone deaf kind of um, political um, posturing, you know, is is the way I look at it. Um, that this man it just it, it, when you don't prepare yourself in the way you appear at at at, at a at a conference, right? Mm -hmm. What does it say? about your capacity to lead a nation, okay? So that's one question. But another question, the fact that you don't see, I just saw a lot of columnists writing about this, the sneakers, some of them defending it, some of them, you know, pillaring uh, his appearance on that account. And I said, I don't see the same kind of scrutiny on his campaign's policy positions or the absence of policy, policy positions on, on a bunch of problems in the, in the country. And that's what we should ultimately focus on, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. We should, have, we should be able to have, you know, we should be able to have uh, a leader who is bohemian and eccentric and wears shorts if he's going to solve problems you know, yeah. uh, the problems that we have as, as, as a nation. Yeah. 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 hundred yeah, percent. Right. Um, in terms of people, are, he's talking about his record, <laughs> you know, he's talking about, you want to, so you, you, people are talking about the, the get up, mm -hmm. but people, obviously Nigerian journalism is, um, journalism generally worldwide is, mm -hmm. is, is in problems. Um, mm -hmm. but, Anything that is in problems worldwide, Nigeria is times 50. <laughs> so, um, nobody's talking about, so let's talk about his record. You know, he's, he's telling people how he handled. He should be talking about how he helped create, but, you know, but help lights the final match that, that created Boko Haram. He and his, his boss, who he, mm -hmm. he goes about telling, remind everybody that that's his boss, Ali Modu Sharif. Yes. Who sat down and took those, um, um, what's the word I used for them? He took uh, these guys who were already on the fringes of society, who wanted to just be left in mode. Impoverished, you know, to you know, they had no weapons. degrees. Yeah. yeah they, they took them, they used them, they put them in government, kicked them out of government, took the, finally got to Muhammad Yusuf and assassinated Muhammad Yusuf publicly. That was essentially them. And that was the, um, that was the, that was pretty much the final this thing for the people that became Boko Haram. I don't mm -hmm. know if you've gotten to watch the BBC documentary on uh, bandits of Zamfara. Mm. 
Yeah, you, you told me about it uh, this week. Mm -hmm. I had to sit down and watch it from start to finish. Uh, you know, it's something that you can't even watch we, and do something else. We, we need to. We it. need to. We need to talk about it. Oh yeah, you know? oh, yeah. yeah. It's something that you you will see. Even the bandits are are, are telling you there that they didn't leave them alone. Hmm. You know, it, it it gives a different perspective. Mm -hmm. Zamfara obviously is is in the northwest. Bronu is in the northeast. Um, it is still Fulani bandits largely. On one side is Zamfara is fighting the Fulanis are fighting the Alsas. On the other side in Bronu, it's fighting both the Alsas and the Kanuris um, other groups. But you know, going back to Shatima's record, mm. um, people will go about and point to, well, Lord, you know, in, in spite, he'll tell you, in spite of the distance, he did this, he did that. Um, they created an airport. Um, you know, I get tired when people, these things, you know, I, I don't typically, this typically is your line when you talk about how nobody should be telling you that they, they constructed a road for you. Mm -hmm. And that's an achievement. You know, when somebody starts telling you they, they did an airport, mm -hmm. okay. Did you need the airport? One, mm -hmm. assuming you did, that's cool. Um, but when you have a functioning country, you will start having so many <laughs> private airfields and airports. I mean, during the war in Biafra, the Biafra has had how many airports? Two major airports in the, space, in the span of less than three years. They had a lot of smaller airfields as well. I live in New York, right? Go on Google. Google how many airports are there in New York State. Um, I'm pretty sure it's over 300, maybe mm -hmm. somewhere around there. You're not talking of big airports, mm -hmm. airports that can land planes. Mm -hmm. that, that's the essence of an airport, right? Mm -hmm. Land planes. The bigger the airport, the one, the more you want more amenities, and yeah. you know you want more comfortable stuff. Somebody goes to, to tie a road somewhere and put a hut and starts clapping for himself, and he goes. <laughs> Like, it's like, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you know which airlines are using this is this creating economic activity for you is it useful for you mm -hmm. um why not even get into the point of a large crazy insecurity in the country i don't know if i said the last time i was watching a youtube video of this bitcoin kid who this kid is you know, like, like kid who um, went to Nigeria and he was trying to convince his friends in the video and his friends didn't want to come and then he goes to Nigeria and they do the Bitcoin conference and even when they get there, they all seem bored. Mm -hmm. They couldn't go anywhere because right from the airport, they brought security for them. There's a kid who made a video. We, this is, it, well, uh, I'll give you the, well, the kid is Swedish, right? But he lives in Dubai. Um, he would, whether he was boasting or not, he would wear his expensive watches in Dubai. When he goes to Sweden, he's like, yeah, he can't wear his watches in Sweden. That Sweden is not safe. <laughs> Sweden. He's telling you Sweden is not safe. Oh, wow. The kid comes to this thing and he, exactly the kind of thing you would say, you know, all the time. And that's why I say, I rather we say, he goes to, it's like, yeah, take me to the most expensive place in Nigeria. And they take him to Banana Island. And, you know, they take him to the guy that designed Davido's, all these celebrities' houses and stuff. And I think, I believe he met the guy, I don't know. But prior to walking into the into the house itself, the apartment, it was an apartment complex, I believe, or distant, he's looking at the streets, there's puddles, he's like wandering, he has security all over him, he's, he, <laughs> he's trying to holler at a lady and ask her, like, look, um, can you show me somewhere? And the lady too is having security in the most expensive place in, 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 in Nigeria. She's, she's, she speaks back to my believe in an American accent and she too, she's a tourist. So imagine mm -hmm. going to um, the West End of London mm -hmm. or going to um, um, uh, Midtown Manhattan. I've seen, Obama, I've seen Obama in Manhattan. I've seen Trump in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. Do they, did they have security? Yes. But to some degree, man, I feel like some of these people that go to Nigeria have way more security than, mm -hmm. than they do. The whole point of this story is to illustrate that people that would have come wouldn't are not coming to Nigeria to bring business, bring activity, bring tourism, um, which is literally dead. People that when they come, they can't even go anywhere. They're stuck in a bubble, just want to leave. Just you know, and you have all these politicians that would come and tell you they fixed the road. 
or her internet. <laughs> it's like if I if I went to Nigeria with my family now, I've been to Brown State before. I can't take my family there. I can't. I can't, man. You know. I mean, where can you really take my, <laughs> take your family to in Nigeria now? Fewer and fewer places, you know. Um, but, you know, you and I were in Nigeria together just in May, right? And you wanted to come visit me in my hometown, and some of your relatives threw a fit. They couldn't. Uh, they thought that it was dangerous. Uh, going on the yeah, route. precisely a dangerous undertaking. Um, so that's that's the scale of, and these are. I mean, I I go to Nigeria, you know, fairly regularly, and I travel with some kind, with some degree, with more freedom than than many residents of that country. You know, so I was there. I was in Nigeria for five um, for five weeks. And people were calling me from Abuja, from Lagos, and saying, ah, you're not afraid? And I said, <laughs> um, yeah, of course, I, I I, mean, clearly I have a sense, you know, I no longer travel as freely as I used to. I used to be able to uh, borrow a car or have a friend give me his driver and just travel by road as far as I wanted, right? So now I'm more conscious of, of, of how to move in the country. But that all speaks to the, the scale of the crisis that we have in that country, you know, um, the, that, that um, you find very few campaigns, uh, presidential campaigns, articulating the problems of the country at the level that ought to be the case, okay, given given how profound the rot is, how, um, again, how pervasive the, the, the problems uh, and how deep the problems are run. Um, so our politicians, by and large, are still speaking as if they're looking at a space that is more stable than Nigeria is, okay? Um, no, the, this is at such a critical point that, you know, when I was in Nigeria, for example, there is a friend of mine uh, who told me that he was going to come in for his daughter's uh, traditional marriage and he wanted to meet um, um, a writer friend of mine, and he, you know, asked if I could make it happen. So here I was in Nigeria, and I contacted him, and I said, um, let me know when you're arriving. And he, you know, he wrote me back and said they had to cancel the event, you know, out of security concerns. Um, <clears throat> so, yes, there are still... Lots of people who go to Nigeria, lots of Nigerians who have a good life in the place. But to read Nigerian newspapers is, is an exercise in torture, emotional torture every day. Um, because you see the kinds of things that are talked about. You see, you know, a young woman who just won a beauty contest in her university in Ogun State, in her polytechnic, and she's kidnapped and she's raped and she's killed. You see a woman who sold her child, three, three or three, four, three years old or four years old, for four hundred thousand naira. Okay, you see people engaged in human sacrifice, either for money rituals or for some other you know, um, uh, some other kind of um, superstition. Um, you see the university strike by ASU, um, which started on February 14, continuing as we speak, and the Minister for Education who had been asked by Buhari to help to resolve that that issue, which is extremely already belated, 
and he takes off. The minister takes off on a trip abroad, you know, um, just yesterday, you know, we found out that Wale Shoinka, Nobel laureate Wale Shoinka had accepted a full-time position to be on the faculty of New York University in Abu Dhabi, where he's going to be teaching theater. Now, <laughs> imagine if it were possible for Shoinka to find the same level of support, financial support, the same level of manpower support, of equipment, for him to return and teach theater. This is a man who has distinguished himself as one of the major practitioners of the art of theater in the world. Can you imagine what we lose as a nation that such a man is going to Abu Dhabi to teach in a program run by New York University instead of in a Nigerian university. Okay. And yet some years ago, when Kofi Awono, the great uh, Ghanaian poet, left his position as ambassador to the UN, um, he returned to Ghana and went back to teaching at the University of Legon. You know? So... At every level, it's as if uh, the, the absence of leadership in the country, the absence of, le of imaginative leaders in Nigeria uh, comes with, a, with costs that are just so massive and that touch different sectors and different facets of the life of the Nigerian society. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I was, I was thinking of it you know, back to the, um, uh, the, 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 the headline we're talking about, just thinking of it like in a, in a serious place in a, in, well, you know, that's even too far for Nigeria in a place where people have any, um, take themselves, you know, take anything seriously whatsoever. Um, if you said you wanted to go have talks, you know, you guys, you guys need to, to leave the country. The last place you go to is, uh, is London, is Europe. You go to maybe the Seychelles or you could go to Jamaica if you want, if you have to go that far. Um, you know, go to Madagascar. Yeah. South Tobia and Principe goes to go to, to go to Accra. <laughs> go, to, go, go to Obasanjo's farm in 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 Abiokuta. You know, at least you know he can produce his a goosey soup and pounded yam, and you eat it there. I mean, these are people who go to Port Harcourt for 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 crying out loud. You it, know, it's a shame. I yeah, mean, I, I, I there's so much Nigeria could offer tourism wise. But it never really fulfilled that potential. Yeah, um, you're yeah. talking about showing I'm just the same thing. A guy at his age probably would love to have a robust pr place in Nigeria where he wants to teach. Yeah, but you know, how many does he himself? He's not sure if they kidnap him too. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Then he would love to invite a lot of professors, other. Mm -hmm. um, literature people other From around come, the world yeah and a lot of them would be like you know we love you but you know if you want to come to london we, we can hang out we with can, you at the yeah, yeah. like, how much time do i have left in this world to sit yeah. there and be yeah you know he's done done it all he's jacked up a radio station he's driven to um um east to try and find a solution out of the civil war mm -hmm. comes back and gets in prison for 20 months 22 months you know been a radical founded pirate mm -hmm. confraternity, which you know, I'm not sure is really what he wanted it to be, but you know, maybe it was, you know. Um, so it's it's um, a situation where what's the solution here? What's like what is happening? Is it not better to probably not hold these elections? You have serious insecurity. I mean, yeah. watch the bandits of Zavara, man. That's that was one really, um, that was one good, really, really good piece of work for sure. Yeah. And, you know, of course it, it talks about a situation that, that is 
happening now. It's not something in the past. It's happening today. And what it says, basically, the implication is that there are swaths of this country where you can't actually have the normalcy that it takes to conduct um, an election that will pass muster. I would say, I know you haven't seen the whole thing, but I would say one part that uh, probably is, that part sticks with me. All right. There's a point where um, the governor comes in and the governor, they were given, you know, they wanted to make a show of getting some people released from the bandits. So they, all these ministers were talking and talking and talking and talking. And the parents, people were angry and they wanted to leave. And eventually they get to a point where everybody realized they had to leave. And that mm -hmm. point was where they were like, this is Zamfara. Mm -hmm. After 5.30 PM, the roads are not safe. Mm -hmm. The government officials too now realize <laughs> that they've been making too much, and they all start trying to run away. And in trying <laughs> to run away, I'm telling you, man, they end up execute killing a boy that came to welcome his sister who was kidnapped. The, and the worst part, the, the, the way the father described it, the father of the boy, oh man, it didn't touch me. I was like, man, the guy sat down. He said the look the government even gave him. Ah, it was like, man, it, 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 it yeah. was just like, look, is this, no, we, is we, this we, where, we, where a whole an, governor a nation. Yeah. is running away mm -hmm. and he running away kills a citizen it, of the state, yeah. yeah, a minor. And there's and no not even recourse. Disturbed. Yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah, there's it's no like, recourse. Yeah, whatever, man. Yeah, you know, there's no recourse. So, I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> there are, sadly, you know, there are Nigerians who don't understand how, how um, messed up, yes, this, our space is back in Nigeria. And so, so when one calls for a suspension of the elections, um, I know somebody wrote, wrote me a private email mocking me and saying that what we need is a certain candidate taking over to solve all the problems. And um, so I said, I said, I said, I could mock your, your naivete. Um, but um, the, the truth is that um, again, with how prejudice to anybody's capacity and abilities, uh, the problems and in Nigeria are now so deep and so big and so profound that, and so structural in nature, okay, so foundational, that it's not something that you're going to hire somebody who will paper over things. It's, it's not a leak. It's a massive hole in it. You know, it's, it's, it's a dam that has failed and the water is just coming at communities and it's going to, it's coming at furious velocity. Is going to destroy whatever is in its path. And so you need uh, to address that issue. You need to address the structural issues with the dam that broke. And so to just say, okay, there's somebody who can, you know, scoop up some buckets of water from the water that is the storm that is coming. Uh, I keep hoping that I, I'll be proved wrong. Um, but I have the sense that if, if we proceed as, as if it were business as usual, and we have elections that regardless of who takes over, that Nigeria may not survive it, may not survive yeah, the, the worst first part time is, of this person. If the, worst, the worst part is if, uh, sorry if I, but no, the most no, part it's, is, it's, it's better off to, if you know something is that bad, it's better off to face it earlier than it faces you. Mm -hmm. Like if you, you look at 
not just the bandits of Zamfara, all these, um, what's the other one again? There's a whole bunch of these guys that have gone in and done a lot of this, talk to ba- actual bandits, um, talk to um, um, militant groups in the country. And it's, it's, you, you don't want that kind of anger um, turned, you know, it, okay. The rest of the country is looking at the Fulanese, for instance, right? The Fulanese, oh, we say, oh, the Fulanese, they, they, with Fulanese, the Fulanese, the Fulanese, the Fulanese are turning around and looking at the rest of the country and saying the rest of the country is looking down on them that they have nobody. It's like, why is this, this everybody's disconnected, man. And this is not, it's, it's like everybody's disconnected. Fulanese are like, we don't have anybody. Every every position is for the outside. They give 100, 100 outside people before they give one Fulani person. Uh, but the rest of the country is looking at like, well, everybody here is Fulani. And, you know, it's it's like everybody is disconnected from everybody. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's dangerous. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's, and, it's I mean, and, and that's in a sense what I tell our fellow Igbo. When an Igbo person says, oh, you know, we're marginalized in this country. My first answer is yes. But 99 and more percent of Nigerians are marginalized, whether they are Hausa, Fulani, Efik, Yoruba, and so on. It is only a tiny cabal, you know, a tiny, less than 1% of Nigerians are the ones who are really, who have cornered the resources of Nigeria and it's been going on for years. And there are, in that number, that tiny number, there are Igbo, there are Fulani, there are uh, Efik, there are, you know, there are people from a widespread of ethnicities in Nigeria who, um, in a sense, there is a, this great uh, story by um, a Nigerian writer, Obin Karam Echawa, um, which is called When Tebu Came to, When Tebu Came to Some Community, right? So it satirizes the whole idea of a few, the elite or the political class saying to the, to the vast majority of people, um, we have a table, we've been civilized, we can no longer eat with food on the floor. We have to eat, eat on the table and there are too many of us, we can't fit uh, all of us around the table, so we're going to eat on your behalf, okay? So you just go and wait uh, you, you let us to go and eat for you. And in a sense, that's what um, Nigerian politicians and the, the broad class of elite do, is that they eat for the rest of us. Okay? And this has been going on. I mean, it's not, you know, even the language of Nigerian political negotiation was always around invoke the idea of eating, right? I remember years ago, whenever a military head of state came to visit any state, the community, the elders from within the state will read an address of welcome in which they will ask for their share of the national cake. <laughs> um, so Nigeria was always envisioned as, as food uh, to be eaten. Um, it was not envisioned ever as food that we have to a, go and produce in our, on our, in our farms uh, that we have to then cook. No, it's all cooked. It's a cake. So it's, let's have our share of the national cake, right? And so with eating, or the few Nigerians who had excessive access have eaten the country to oblivion. And so that's why I'm saying, and nobody, less, nobody's baking any new people. Are not making nobody's new baking any cake. They, 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 you know, that's lack of imagination, right? Mm-hmm. So, so, and that's why I get angry when a governor sits down, a governor who likes to go to Dubai, right? Likes to go to London, likes to go to South Africa. And you go there and you see a well-ordered society. You see what it looks like. You know that, you know, what their hospitals look like, you know, what their roads look like, you know, what their police look like, you know, um, you know, what uh, crime fighting looks like, you know, you know, what educational systems, because they send their children to those 
countries, you know, to get educated and so on. So you know what a well-ordered society is. Then you come back to Nigeria and you insult the intelligence of Nigerians who don't know any better by saying, oh, yeah, I built uh, 200 kilometers of roads. Have you ever gone to Dubai or to South Africa or to the UK or to Germany anywhere and heard a leader, whether this leader is a mayor, a sheikh, a prime minister, a president, say, my achievement is I built roads. You know, these are taken for granted that roads are there. And if there are new developments, new areas where people didn't live and people decide to go and clear them and build houses, the government will provide roads and maintain the roads. It goes without saying, right? Everywhere else. But in Nigeria, roads are an achievement, not just an achievement there, the achievement. Okay, so when Nigerians are saying to you, ah, the governor has walked or you say, what has he done? He, bu he built roads. And I say, how did we accept this absolute, absolute erasure of meaningful measures of achievement? Okay, and so we come to the point where a governor paying salaries becomes an achievement. Even when a governor is owing 12 months salaries, if he pays three months, people say, ah, let's praise him. At least he has tried. Without regard to the fact that the same governor receives not only his salary every month that he has not paid you, but steals, receives his security vote, most of which he steals, awards contracts and gets kickbacks from those contracts, which are massive kickbacks. So we accept it. And of course, one of the things we accept is the notion that the governor should never go to jail, you know, because there's always somebody who says he's our son and we have to protect him. And uh, so we need to reorder society. We need to, uh, we need to pause and see. And by the way, when I say we need to, create a society for the first time out of Nigeria, a meaningful, coherent society. It's not inevitable that it will happen. Indeed, it is possible that that's no longer possible. And if it isn't possible, then we say Nigeria has been a terrible job. Let us find an amicable way of separating into our whatever clannish, ethnic, um, you know, uh, particularities, you know, so yeah. Yeah. I don't know. We, we, we've gone on and on, you know, there are other issues which I, I, I thought to bring up, you know, IPOB's, um, statement that, uh, you know, that they are not interested in the Pito, in Pito's presidency, but, you know, we have, um, it's a conversation that we can have another day, and we are going to uh, definitely get to um, to the BBC's uh, documentary. Yeah, we should. Yeah, one hundred percent. So, yeah. All right. That is. So, uh, it's such a delight again to have all of you uh, tune in and watch this episode of our podcast. Um, we invite you. Uh, to tell your friends about us, to tell your family about us, and to bring them in. We want all of you to be part of the conversation. Write in. Let us know what you think, uh, whether you disagree with us, whether you agree with us, whether you uh, sort of agree on some issues and disagree on other issues. We would really, really treasure uh, your feedback. So, but have a brilliant, brilliant week, and see you again soon. All right.